I think America is very afraid at this moment, very concerned for its security and safety, searching about for, for solutions for scapegoats, but not constructively, destructively. If they'd take these dopers and the criminals and the rapists and the muggers and simply put them to sleep, we wouldn't have any problems. But oh, the poor things, they were disadvantaged. I was just terrified, and I'll never forget the feeling. And I just don't want to ever have that feeling again. I just want to be able, like I said, I want to be able to protect myself. Fear, fear, fear. And what we've done is we've paralyzed the nation. People's liberty is being taken away from them um, by default. Drop it! No! We're heading for a lot of trouble, believe me. The fate of Minneapolis is tied to the fate of the nation. As the nation goes, so shall it go. Feast your eyes on the South Bronx. Acres of New York City laid to waste by crime and fear. There is desolation everywhere. And perhaps we should get used to seeing this. It may just be the city of the future. Good evening. Tonight, a sober reminder about a problem that is dangerously worsening and a warning that its costs may be higher than ever suspected. The problem is street crime, which has risen now to outlandish proportions, even in those towns and rural areas once thought to be quite safe. The courts are working overtime, the prisons are bulging, and still there is more senseless violence, many times more than just a short while ago. Yet as dramatically as the crime rate has risen, its cost in human fear has soared even higher. It's a matter of vital importance because fear of crime appears to be gnawing at the very core of our American optimism making us afraid of one another, forcing us into self-protective isolation, destroying our whole way of life. Perhaps worst of all, we are gradually adapting and accepting. Presuming the disease of crime to be incurable, we strive only to cope with the symptoms. What operates in this environment is potentially very destructive, since all we do is react to fear and present danger. You've been taking therapy now? Back on therapy? Uh, well, I will be. You will be going yeah. back? The same woman? I don't know. The uh, star on my head. Yes? Yeah. It's up. I, I've got a score up there now. In your brain? Yeah. Still? Yeah. They say how long they'll take before they'll heal? No. He's not at all the kind of person he was. He was a very robust, outgoing individual who was just happy with life in general. Uh, since his accident, he's become uh, less willing to try to talk to somebody because he can't emphasize his words correctly. He has to sit and think about it, and whatever comes up in his head doesn't come out the same way. So he became more or less an introvert. Well, I'm not uh, uh, quick in my hands and think of what I used to be. I was out for, I think, 22 days in a hospital. And when I wake up, my son, Gene, was there. It's been very difficult for me because I've had to make all the arrangements for him. Just a lot of time off of work, a lot of expense, a lot of, a lot of hurt feelings, and just, uh, it's hard to take. I didn't see the man come at me. I don't, uh, I didn't know it was going to happen. If I did, I wouldn't him be here. It was an April afternoon in 1980. 
John Fenning was leaving a liquor store with the six pack of beer he had just bought there. Then someone in the parking lot demanded he hand it over. John refused. Moments later, he lay unconscious, struck in the head with a wine bottle. It's, it's hard to put into words actually how I feel about it. It's just, uh, he's gonna be this way for the rest of his life and the other fellow's gonna be free to do it again to someone else. The words to justice. To say that crime is on the rise is to risk being ignored. You've heard about it before. I know. We've all been hearing about it for years. And while we've perhaps been turning a deaf ear, crime has grown even faster. The question is, at which point will we decide not to ignore it any longer? Take a look at this. It's the murder rate for Minneapolis, a nice, safe town. Murder is a good statistic because unlike most crime, it gets reported. In a little over a generation, we went from six murders a year to 36. Meanwhile, the population fell 150,000. The murder rate, murders per 100,000, increased in 23 years 860%. Here's New York, a so-called dangerous city. Much more murder but many more people. The likelihood of being murdered in New York is still three times greater than it is in Minneapolis, but that may not be for long. New York's murder rate has increased about 640% since 1957. Remember, that's the same period of time during which Minneapolis's rate increased nearly 900%. Someone in a unique position to comment on such figures is Anthony Boza. In 1953, he became a police officer in New York City. 20 years later, he was assistant chief, commanding a force of over 3,000 in the Bronx. Today, he is chief of police in Minneapolis. Over the nation, over the last few years, we have seen a, a, a rapid and scary escalation of violent crime. It's not just an abstraction, it's a reality. The reality is that, uh, that one out of every perhaps three households in New York City was touched by a very serious crime in 1980. 700,000 felonies in a city of 7 million. Talking about a city that had over five murders a day. When I became a policeman, there was one murder a day. That's not improved reporting. We were just as good at counting bodies in 1953 as we were in 1980. One recent and disturbing trend is an increase in rural crime. Nationwide, rural crime is rising faster than urban crime. In preparing this program, we picked one county in southern Minnesota at random. Although situated an hour and a half's drive from any urban area, the sheriff's office there reported that in the last year alone, residential burglary had risen a whopping 44%. At one point, a burglary ring was striking daily, stealing valuables from cars parked at this liquor store stealing implements, fertilizer, and gasoline from surrounding farms. Meanwhile, this drugstore in a town of 1,500 has been burglarized eight times in 13 years. Don Entwistle is the proprietor. This is something you associate with the city. And, uh, uh well, I guess my mind has been changed. <laughs> this is the same county where, in 1976, the sheriff was shot and killed while serving mental commitment papers. And where, more recently, an elderly woman was beaten to death by a stranger in her home outside of town. Of course, these are the crimes that make small town headlines. We can only wonder how many lesser tragedies lie unreported. Well, uh, on the 22nd of April, we went out at 11 o'clock in the morning and found three of our top show dogs dead in their kennels. They were the victim of being poisoned. Dot Pryor says the poisoning took place after her rural area underwent some real estate development and one of the new neighbors began making threats related to the dog's barking. The three dogs, she says, were valued at $45,000. But even for a relatively minor incident like this one, the real cost can be told accurately only in human terms. I couldn't love them more if they were children. And Misty was our first purchase. And um, 
She was born the day my mother died and almost the same hour. And I used my mother's money to buy her. So she was very special. And she was everything we wanted. She was that one perfect dog. It was horrible. And I look out there now, and I'll never get over seeing them out there. Three twenty-one. To be on a first match, occurred about uh, thirty minutes ago. Meanwhile, back in the city, violent crime increased an average of thirteen percent last year, according to the FBI. Overall, crimes against property rose somewhat less, except for burglary, which outpaced even violent crime. Minneapolis, that nice, safe city now practically leads the nation in burglary. There were more than 11,500 of them in 1980. The burglary rate in Minneapolis has now risen 1,400% since the early 50s. Minneapolis today has a higher burglary rate than New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago. Jeff Drake and his wife Lisa are just two of the more recent victims. We went in the place, it was just a shambles. And, uh, First was shock, you know, and just, God, what have they taken? And so we started doing a real quick inventory. And uh, it wasn't until later that evening when I just, we started picking up things that I realized, God, they got all my suits. You know, you don't go through your closets. It's the last thing I thought anybody would take is my clothes. And uh, after, then it was anger. Then I got really upset. You know, you're feel really violated. I was just kind of dazed. Um, I never expect anything like this to happen to me. Um, I grew up in a very, you know, well-to-do neighborhood where you just never heard of anything like this. Again, this crime was relatively minor, but the impact can be profound, even for those we might otherwise think of as streetwise or tough enough to take it in stride. She just bailed me out. And when I was coming home, there was a car in the alleyway. And I thought, somebody's ripping off my house. And we pulled up in the front, and the car took off out of the alley. What kind of a car was it? I had no idea. All I seen was the lights when we, when we were driving. It's not much. I mean, <clears throat> what time? was the stereo. Otherwise, they would have got a whole lot more. I brought it to a charge account. I charged it, and I, I just got them painted off. They didn't get the TV. They got half my tapes. But there's one on the floor here, and there was one on the floor in the kitchen. Okay, is anything else been home. tampered with? I mean, like these doors the Closet went through. Closet's been gone through. Yeah, nothing's, nothing's there's missing. nothing worth stealing out of there except for my leathers. And which they took my full... Where's my full-length leather? It's gone. Okay, they took one of my, one of my leathers. Holy Christ. Paid two ninety nine ninety five for the receivers, are they? I believe so. <clears throat> and then there is a cassette player too, though. Two speakers. Hey, I'll tell you what. My house got robbed tonight, little brother. And you better tell all them dudes on the north side I'm gonna hunt every one of you down until I get it back. Tommy, that's you too. You shut your drunken little mouth. You hear me? No, no. You just find my stuff. Bye. <laughs> I'll do anything I can to generally home so that... If I find out who it is, too, I'll definitely give you the name. And I want him prosecuted. You know, I'll prosecute anybody. If you find out anything on them, find any of this stuff anywhere, and you find somebody turned in, I'll prosecute to the fullest. I don't care who it is. Yeah, I I mean, I've done a lot of things, but I never took nobody from anybody's house. Nothing, ever. And it just really makes me mad. As dramatic as the immediate effects of crime can be on its victims, it is the aftermath, the fear and suspicion, which amplifies the damage, sending shockwaves throughout a community and changing the way we live. Sponsored by a corporate conglomerate, the Figgy Report on Fear of Crime tells part of the story. Our actual chance of being victimized by crime remains even today in the fractions of a percentage point. But about 40% of Americans now say they are highly fearful of crime. One of the advisors to the Figgy Report was Anthony Boza. The Figgy Report spoke to the issue 
of increasing fear. How Americans are changing their living patterns. We don't go downtown so much. We don't go out at night so much. We have all kinds of locks on our doors. We're very suspicious of strangers. We don't wear ostentatious jewelry. We have become, we're changing our living patterns. Basically, I don't go to a lot of places I used to go. I don't take chances anymore. I uh, get to the point in my age where I'm not a young kid and I have to realize that this could happen to me as well as anyone else. It happened to my father, it could happen to anyone. We built this house and bought this lot because it was secluded and we could raise our dogs. And we would sell our house for less than it cost us to build it right now to get out of here. We're at the point where we'll take any offer just to get out. I have never been afraid one day in my life until this happened. And I'm terrified to go get the mail now. Every time I go out, you know, I'm kind of looking over my shoulder, you know, wondering if there's somebody behind me or uh, somebody following me. You know, and it's just, I don't think I should have to live like that. It's like you're afraid to come home sometimes. You come home and you just wonder, what am I going to find? Is there going to be somebody behind the door when you get in? As the violence increases, the suspicion, the hostility, the anger, the violence increases and feeds upon itself. I think I'll, I always advise our citizens, be alert. Be careful, use, be precautionary, be sensible, but don't be afraid because the spooked human animal always does dysfunctional things. For months there was, a, I'd gotten to the point where I went out looking for him, you know, and that was no good, of course, but uh, when it, something like that happens to you, you feel such anger that you just like to, you know, do things that you normally wouldn't do. It's, it's, I don't know, it's just, I feel like killing the neighbors, you know? Because I, they're, 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 they're there. Every time a motorcycle starts, they're complaining, you know, or anything. But they can't hear somebody going through the back door with a crowbar. You're all of a sudden, I was faced with a situation where my first reaction is, I want to go out and buy a gun, you know, and I don't like that. Uh, you shouldn't have to feel that way in the city. Jeff and Lisa Drake share their duplex on Minneapolis's Park Avenue with Brian and Kathy Shawning. Together, the Drakes and the Shawnings spent a weekend fortifying their homes against further intruders. Well, these aren't the most uh, attractive things on the windows. Well, it's, it doesn't matter at this point, I guess. The Drakes literally barred some of their windows. And although the Shawnings' apartment was untouched by the burglary, Brian installed a stronger lock. Both couples said they would move out of the neighborhood as soon as time and money permitted. With deadbolt locks, burglar alarms, and chemical mace, Americans are reportedly going to unprecedented lengths to defend themselves against crime. But few barometers of public fear are as telling and as worthy of public scrutiny as the handgun. Handgun ownership in the U.S. has skyrocketed to a point where today some 55 million of them are in circulation. The implication is that perhaps more than ever, Americans are ready to use deadly force against one another. We are selling a lot more guns to the general public. We can't keep enough guns in stock for the cops, so we've had to restrict a lot of them for police only after 30 days of... Lori Eggeman is the manager of Law Enforcement Equipment Company in Bloomington. Guys, and women especially, too. Women that have never looked at a gun twice are coming in and the husband's putting the gun in the woman's hand and she's looking at it like, what do I do with this, right? But they're teaching her how to shoot. She keeps it, she keeps it loaded. They're not afraid to say anymore that if somebody walks into my house, I want to stop them. You know, today they're saying that all the time. They say, I'm afraid and I want them stopped. Um, so they're going with the bigger calibers and they're loading them and they're keeping them loaded. On Los Angeles's Venice Beach, near a row of fashionable condominiums, we met Peter Lake, a freelance writer. It was here late one Saturday night that a neighbor woman approached Lake with a look of terror in her face. She explained that Three men with guns and knives had broken into her place and uh, had tied up her boyfriend, had tried to rape her, and she had managed to slip out a uh, sliding uh, glass door. Returning to Lake's apartment, they discovered all police emergency lines busy. By the time they received an answer, 18 minutes later, the men had already fled, 
fortunately without seriously harming anyone. The event changed Peter Lake. Everyone in the country has to assume some of the responsibility for their own self-protection and the protection of their neighbors. The social contract where people uh, depend on the police for protection and the police uh, uh, have all the weapons it has been broken. It, it simply uh, doesn't stand up anymore. Peter Lake considers himself a liberal, a humanitarian. So it may surprise some that he has joined the millions of Americans who advocate carrying guns. Unlike most handgun owners, however, Lake is not only armed, but highly trained as well. And this is Peter Lake's alma mater, Arizona's gun site ranch, home of the American Pistol Institute. Ready? The students are almost entirely professionals. Actors, lawyers, at least a half dozen doctors. The instructors as well are moonlighting pilots or attorneys. Again! Right in the snot locker, ready? But this is the headmaster, the owner and founder. The colonel, he's called, after his old Marine Corps rank. I could take the zipper off your pants and not break the skin. Get up on the line. <laughs> His real name is Jeff Cooper, and he's regarded highly enough to be in demand as a gun instructor by both government and private agencies worldwide. When you leave here, you should be able to face a life and death confrontation and instead of saying, oh my God, I didn't think this could happen to me, you'll say, I knew this could happen to me. I thought it might, and I know what to do. According to Cooper, there is a six-month waiting list of prospects ready to pay the $500 fee for his six-day course. A criminal record check is required of applicants, and Cooper is convinced his students are the good guys. The thing we face at this point is the very natural problem of taking lethal action against another human being. When you are in a lethal situation, your primary concern is not how much you're going to hurt him, but how much he may hurt you. And you stop him as best you can. Uh, the criminal, the heavy criminal today, the, the predator, the sociopath, uh, does not fear uh, the courts. He does not fear the jails. He does not fear the police. What he must be taught to fear is his victim. On into the desert night, an entire motel full of gun sight students reviews the day's lesson. In the headshot that, that they had showed us, uh, one of the important points is on the back side of the motor part of the brain back in here. And you won't catch that unless you are, say, like above the teeth, below the frontal lobe in there, in an area just about like this. And, and as far as the bullet, First of all, you got to back up and get the first two shots in here. The only reason that you'd use a head shot is that if the first two shots haven't stopped. So you come out and you draw and you say, bam, bam, stop, and the guy doesn't stop, then you move up to the head and you put one right there and that's usually final. Across the motel courtyard, we met more gun sight students. Their hands literally blistered from shooting. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever shot a gun. I shook. I was, my hands were just like, I was trembling. And the first time... Pat Jock and her husband, Boyce, live outside Reno, Nevada. Boyce is an orthodontist. Both said they would rather not be armed, but feel it's necessary today. Well, it's something that's kind of taken a, a time to arrive at a decision on it. Uh, several years ago, and never even entered my mind. And then it seems like the last three or four years, the... We had a girl was hitchhiking and somebody cut her arms off and left oh. her. I mean, just senseless things. I mean, no reason for it. We've had, we've had a few kidnappings and very brutal murders of children who were, you know, apparently parents thought they were supervised in, in a park area where a child has been kidnapped and then murdered. Uh, 
I don't know why people do things like that, but I certainly don't want it to happen to my wife or my family. And if I can train myself to prevent that, then I feel secure and they feel secure. And our children are going to come through this course when they get old enough to be responsible for it. And I hope their children, if it's necessary, do it. I can remember years ago and the thought of being afraid never entered my mind. I've just seen so many instances and so many things happen and heard of so many different things that uh, I'm much more cautious than I used to be. I've had my office broken into. I've had my cars robbed right in my own driveway. And uh, it just seems to be more and more crime all the time. And there has to be a reason. I don't know the reason, but there seems to be more crime all the time. And I really believe that even with what I have learned in these three days, I can take care of myself. I'll be able, you know, to put my little family behind me and take care of them. After a few days, students are thrown into situations more demanding than the target range. Exercise is intended to more closely parallel real life. There is an emphasis, not just on how to shoot and when to shoot, but when not to shoot as well. In the fun house, an instructor posed as a student. Let's get him. Hey, man! Come on in. We've been waiting for you. Come out of there, lady. No way! Come on out. Blow your head off, man! Do something, man! Get out of there! What? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything! Come out of there, lady! I'm, I'm just standing here, man! Don't, don't bother me! No, no, look! Do you see a weapon? Do you see a weapon anywhere on that lady? No. Why? Why did you do that? You're not thinking. You have got to think. You don't pull the trigger at anyone you see. If that had been your home, it could have been your wife. Next door neighbor, whatever. Now think. Holy cow, look at that Here guy. Here I come. I'm coming. Despite the restraints students are expected to learn here, proponents of handgun control are likely to be unhappy with anything which sanctions increased personal armament. Regardless, the gun sight raises an interesting prospect. Perhaps some form of mandatory gun training. Almost certainly, it would be better than what is promoted now. How many... Uh, traffic disputes are now resolved by gun battles. I mean, that's an increasing phenomenon. How often do, uh, do people get involved in, in gun battles that are neither of one of whom is a criminal? They've armed themselves in self-defense, see a fear. Most people who arm themselves wind up killing themselves or somebody they know and love rather than any criminal. Ready? Students here are instructed that they are to use a gun only when human life is threatened. They also know their encountering such an instance is quite unlikely, which leads one to an unstated subtlety about this course, just as the purpose of outward bound goes beyond the mere scaling of cliffs. This training uses the 45 caliber pistol to instill self-confidence. What Jeff Cooper really has for sale is peace of mind. We get a lot of talk about, about fear, this business of throwing around saying, oh, well, everybody's terrified. You hear it on the radio all the time. People are terrified to go out in the streets. No, they're not. Not if they can handle it. That's what you came here for to learn, see? So let's get rid of that fear attitude. Let's get used to the attitude that you are wearing this pistol not because you were afraid, but because you were careful. People look at your gun and say, you're, you're wearing a gun. What are you afraid of? And you say, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm all set. <laughs> you should be afraid. All you have to do is read the papers or look at the television and you'll see people whimpering. Uh, not only whimpering, but expecting everybody to follow them now. We all, by the numbers, let's all whimper together. Uh, that is a loss of courage. It's not necessary, though. Instead of whimpering and locking our doors and staying inside at night and telling our children that they must be off the streets, we should look at these people who are doing these things and say, we're going to fix your wagon. You can't do that.
For the first time ever in the 20th century, man himself holds the power to destroy most of life as we know it. The nuclear age has brought with it an overall atmosphere conducive to fear. Dr. Robert Lifton is an author and professor of psychiatry at Yale University. Dr. Lifton also sits on the board of Physicians for Social Responsibility, a group concerned about nuclear war. Americans are more afraid now, recently, than they have been in the past. And when asked why, well, there is a sense that we're less in control of our lives. This has to do first with an immediate economic stress, uh, the economic outlook doesn't seem good. There doesn't seem to be any clear-cut avenue of optimism, of improvement in a, in a very strong way. We're not used to this as Americans. And you add to those, then, the nuclear issue, something I'm much concerned with in my work, which I think has a much greater impact on everything. It's like an overall frame in which everything else rests. Recent years have provided still more images of the apocalypse the sense that our planet is being depleted of necessary resources, and the impression that we are gradually poisoning the air, water, and soil upon which we depend for life itself. We are aware that our world has become more crowded, and yet both our technology and our style of living conspire to isolate us physically and emotionally from one another. The mechanization of travel has turned vast portions of the landscape into a kind of a no-man's land. The lone pedestrian often feels at risk, and in turn may become reluctant to venture out at all. In many parts of this country, we've abandoned the streets to the police and the criminals. Uh, so that it's, uh, and that feeds upon itself because a, a city that, that, that lives and breathes and has vitality and people around it is a much safer city than one where the streets are deserted and everyone is huddled in their homes. And there is no safety in that huddling. No safety, and some might argue no peace of mind either. We constantly try to establish boundaries in our world in order to be secure in it. Yi Fu Tuan is a professor of geography at the University of Minnesota. His book, Landscapes of Fear, is a study of man's age-old struggle with being afraid. The home is a, a refuge or shelter or, or haven. <laughs> and, and all these are comforting terms. Until we start to ask shelter from what, haven from what. So the home itself, if we look at it, the, in a rather paranoid way, is a defense against threats, strangers, and, and nature outside of us. Even at home, the tenuous tranquility is invaded by electronic phantoms of violence and danger. Researchers tell us that television entertainment violence affects us subconsciously and that heavy viewers of it express more fear and spend more money on self-protection measures than do light viewers. News Weekend, Update 4. Media exposure to real-life violence has its effects, too. Good evening. With a curfew now in effect, the only persons on the streets of Miami's riot-torn areas are police, National Guardsmen, and numerous snipers, looters, and torchmen setting dozens of fires that are now burning out of control. It's a disaster. It's a war zone. There's a war going on out there. Most of the children in Atlanta's ordeal were from poor neighborhoods. Two of the boys were last seen at the shopping center. What has happened to these children has cast a chill over this city and it's changed the way people live and think. It, it's just really scary. 
As events underscore our powerlessness to control crime with traditional law enforcement, we cope by subconsciously conditioning ourselves, accepting as normal situations which once may have triggered outrage. As violence is rep repeated and we are conditioned, obviously we're becoming inured to violence, and then it requires a more serious event to capture our attention. At this point in New York City, I think in order to make a headline, you would have to have, as has happened not too terribly long ago, 10 or 11 people killed in one apartment. That will capture the public attention, but one or two or three uh, is not sufficient to capture anyone's attention. Periodically, public attention is focused intensely on what might be called super crimes, serious attacks on key world leaders. According to experts, these have an especially profound effect on our collective mindset. The assassination attempt becomes associated with the ap apocalyptic imagery I've been talking about earlier. Americans feel their national body, so to speak, falling apart. The country falling apart, the nation falling apart. All these things contribute to an apocalyptic atmosphere and a general sense that everything could end that the world could be destroyed. Well, I'll bet the next two years brings the total collapse of world civilization, and the next uh, three years after that will be uh, more or less uh, the pot boiling, and it'll be total absolute chaos, except in places like this. It'll be, here it'll be just like a Shangri-La barely touched from the outside. Kurt Saxon calls himself a survivalist. In fact, he fancies himself a survivalist's guru. And from his garage, he distributes his book series, The Survivor, a how-to guide for those who believe the survivalist scenario, the scenario that economic disaster, nuclear war, or some other calamity will terminate social order entirely and result in a veritable orgy of lawlessness. The rioting will be continuous, the burning, the looting, the people trying to survive it, uh, no matter what it takes, usually at someone else's expense. And they'll flood the, the, er, the rural areas in droves, and the, that will alarm the rural types, and they'll set up roadblocks and uh, threaten to shoot anyone who tries to come through. Well, they could be on the cliffs there and just snipe if they're threatened enough, they'll blow up the roads or blockade them. You can just come there and then just put maybe like a case of dynamite there and you could drop the whole part of that bluff right on any individual vehicle if that's what you wanted to do. Of course, Kurt Saxon is just one member of a growing movement. In an isolated Utah mountainside, promoters are already constructing Turrine Arc 1, a 240-unit underground condominium designed to survive social collapse. The whole complex will be ringed with pillboxes. Each windowless apartment comes complete with a four-year supply of freeze-dried food recessed into walls and furniture. As survival becomes big business, mail-order companies like California Survival Incorporated are springing up everywhere, reaping the profits of doom. SI sells everything from freeze-dried food to Geiger counters to guns and claims a mailing list of 45,000 names, most customers living in large cities. SI's owner and founder is Bill Peer. He says he's preparing for cuts in the welfare budget. If a person who has been used to getting everything from somebody else are, is not used to or not able to go out and work for things, all of a sudden doesn't have it coming, cannot get enough money to eat, can't get enough food, so, sooner or later, they're going to make a decision of what I'm going to do, and I think, unfortunately, too many of them are going to go out and say, take it from somebody who has it. Uh, first of all, you ought to have a pistol for your bedroom, a shotgun to get anyone who might be coming through a door or window, and a rifle like that for anyone coming from a little further away. And if I were in the cities, I would make sure that I had these weapons because uh, with dope being rampant, my gosh, uh, they'll rip you off for anything. They, they, they get this dope habit and it's spreading and it's getting worse and worse all the time and no one's safe. People are going insane all over the country. 
Saxon fancies himself something of a weapons expert. He designed one gun himself, something he calls the crowd pleaser. That's my 11 shot shotgun that uh, all I have to do is just hold back the trigger and pump it and it'll fire as fast as I can pump. Another brainchild of Mr. Saxon's is The Poor Man's James Bond, a book of directions for improvising your own weapons and bombs. With more than 50,000 copies shipped, it's a Saxon bestseller. Well, if civilization collapses and we didn't have manufactured weapons handy, The Poor Man's James Bond will equip an individual or a division to take on the federal government or the Russians or the Martians. I don't care who's coming down. If you have the poor man's James Bond, you're invincible. The book contains the recipes for a range of concoctions, including one particularly lethal poison called prussic acid. And uh, it's a great assassin's weapon. And, uh, well, you just put it in a water pistol and you shoot it in someone's face, and if a drop goes up his nose or in his mouth, he drops dead in 30 seconds. And woe to the person who tries to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I think that'd be funny. Despite all the tough talk, at the bottom line, Kurt Saxon gives us the impression he is first and foremost a businessman. He has taken his college degree in journalism and chemistry and made himself a walking media event. Meanwhile, he says his book sales double every year. You see, I think that a lot of my customers are paranoid, they're frightened, and uh, it says the poor man's James Bond. People look at the 007 and they say, listen, this guy has power, and I'd like to have that power too, but they don't have any agency making sophisticated weaponry for them, so they can take the poor man's James Bond, and it's like giving some total loser an instant black belt in karate. Even if Kurt Saxon is mostly talk, Apparently, his message is increasingly in demand. Some can only wonder where such ideas shall lead us. To me, the survival is calling for a return to the caves and the trees, and, uh, and uh, I think that is simply absurd. Uh, and even and they are not, uh, no one can possibly take something like that too seriously. Is there any safety in the hills? I mean, do you think that are they going to remain untouched? Can someone go into the hills and live outside of what is happening to the rest of American society? That would be hopeless. Wherever you are, you are going to be touched by the fate of the nation. The struggle for America's soul and future is in the Bronx. That's the frontier. We'll visit the frontier right after this. Fear, we are told by those who study such things, is not entirely without redeeming value. It is, for example, one of the reasons our species survives. Fear sometimes is the only thing that saves us. And so tonight, a hopeful sign, awakened perhaps by fear, some of us now are just beginning to stir from our slumber of self-neglect, starting constructively to make the first hesitant steps out of the shadows of helplessness and inaction. Our theory, and of course we have no way of knowing for sure, but our theory is opportunity plus the offender equals the crime. If we can in fact decrease the opportunity, we decrease the crime. The very crime wave which threatens to break so many neighborhoods apart is today welding others together. A growing national trend is reflected in this block club meeting in South Minneapolis. Under a program known locally as Community Crime Prevention, neighbors overcome suspicion and fear by banding together against crime. Police officers are made available not just to give advice, but also to learn about specific crime problems in the neighborhood. And so it goes in isolated pockets across the nation hopeful signs, even where the obstacles are the greatest. New York's South Bronx, victim of economic woe and arson for profit. Inner city tract so tough that its police precinct house was nicknamed Fort Apache, a last outpost for civilization and order in a scorched wilderness of crime and depravity. Yet from these very ashes, 
rose a remarkable phoenix. They call themselves the Guardian Angels Safety Patrol. They ride the toughest subway trains and walk the roughest city parks in all New York. With headquarters in a Bronx apartment, the Guardian Angels are strictly unofficial, all volunteer, and scrupulously clean of any weapons. Now, 700 strong, they derive their impact and effectiveness from the fact that they are just neighbors who care. Their leader is Curtis Sliwa. Angels just call him The Rock. Once again, the situation is never going to get rectified until the people get off their duffs, stop feeling sorry for themselves, and begin to interact with one another. Know who your neighbor is. Take upon yourself the responsibility for your neighbor's possessions and their civil rights. You got to do it in the blocks, the neighborhoods. Because if you don't do it there, I don't care how many cops you have. I don't care how many volunteers. I don't care what kind of judicial system, what kind of mayor, what kind of political process you have. You're going to continue to have that increase in crime. Prowling this subterranean landscape like something from a Tolkien fable, Sliwa sometimes appears as if from nowhere to exert his absolute authority over the patrols. It only takes one mistake. And you wonder why you ain't getting your shirts? That's why you ain't getting your shirts, because you're f***ing up. One more, and that's it. Eliminate everybody. The whole organization is run on a shoestring, financed by a combination of donations and Sliwa's personal savings. Nobody draws a salary and angels buy their own berets and t-shirts. Anyone have change of a quarter? Communication is maintained by public telephone and through a curious system of hand signals. The guardian angels may be loosely organized, but they are not entirely untrained. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, is anybody tired here? No! I can't hear you. No! Tired here? No! Okay. In grimy basement space donated by a Bronx apartment owner, the angels learn how to handle themselves if ever they're required to fight. Eight! Nine! Ten! My grandmother kicks harder than that. If, I, if you kick anyone on a train like that, so you got a mugger attacking you with a knife or something, you're not going to do nothing. You got to kick him hard. Kick him like you just... Like you just raped your mother. Yeah! 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 Although a few guardian angels are as old as their 30s, most are teenagers. They do not appear to come from wealthy households. The hours are long, the conditions unglamorous, and the pay non-existent. The question is, what's in it for these kids? A handshake, a smile, a thank you. I may never have been complimented in my life. Suddenly I'm a guardian angel, I live in a world of compliments. So naturally, these are the encouragements for young people to get involved in that kind of volunteer service. I've seen them help people and they've helped me one time. Well, I think this is a good idea. <laughs> How do you feel when you're on the train and they're on there? I feel safe. A patrol of guardian angels staged this assault when we asked how they would respond to an actual crime. They say their object is simply to defuse the situation while somebody calls the police. If they can, the angels make a citizen's arrest of the wrongdoer and hold him until official help arrives. Unfortunately, the official help has been less than supportive. Hinting that the guardian angel approach smacks of vigilantism the New York Transit Police have been reluctant to recognize them. Relations are so icy, most officers refuse even to discuss the angels publicly. The message to citizens is the, exactly the wrong one. God knows we need more and more of that sort of involvement. I'm not encouraging vigilantism, but I am encouraging citizen involvement, citizen participation, citizen concern, citizen activism, and we need more and more of it, not less and less. And the, the message that the bureaucracy is giving them is, 
get out. You know, let us handle it. That's madness. This attitude was never preached years ago, non-involvement. All of a sudden, we have a police department that's telling people, don't get physically involved. Call a cop. Leave it to us. We're the professionals. You're the amateurs. You're going to get hurt. If you get involved, you're going to tragically be at the butt end of any tragic circumstances that befall you. Fear, fear, fear. And what we've done is we've paralyzed the nation. Paralyzed the nation that once was very strong. In the final analysis, the value of the guardian angels lies far from their efficiency as policemen. The service the guardian angels provide us is simply their image, an image of strength, active caring, and fearlessness, commodities seemingly in short supply these days. The guardian angels deserve credit not just for capturing or deterring wrongdoers, but for capturing the imaginations of the young, people who, but for this role model, could have gone terribly wrong. Finally, the guardian angels can be thanked for focusing some public attention on a problem that must not go begging any longer. We should be generating a national debate as we did with the Vietnam War, with the, with the ecology movement, with the consumer movement, with the defense movement, with the threat of Soviet Russia, and get the citizens involved asking questions, not begging for answers from pundits like me, but, but searching our own souls as citizens and beginning the Socratic exercise of questioning so that we begin to, to, to discover the, the forces that we have set in motion that are creating all of this gratuitous violence. I think that the fate of black America and Hispanic America is in the balance because as America gets more frightened, it is going to become increasingly repressive. The human animal is very dangerous when frightened. It leads to Hitlers, it leads to Holocausts, it leads to repressions. And I'm afraid that as America continues to, to become increasingly afraid, it is going to seize simple, quick fixes, quick solutions to very painful problems. A footnote here to our segment on the guardian angels. The city of New York has now reversed its original position and decided to sanction the guardian angel safety patrol. Meanwhile, angel chapters have spread to some 18 major cities in addition to New York. To both bits of news, we say bravo. It is, we feel, about time some of our tough young people spend their nights not ripping us off, but helping us out. Then maybe we can all start asking some difficult questions because no display of adolescent daring alone is ever going to make things right. It is, after all, not really from the fear that we bar our doors and windows, but the crying. For years, we've built more jails, written more laws, and hired more policemen. Now we're keeping a gun under the pillow, as though that were the solution all along. None of this so much as asks the question, what's causing all this crime? It's a question of national priorities as we abandon the social programs, which with effort might have worked someday, we're fixing to dump our talent and national treasure into defense from some threat overseas. We're keeping America safe while we lose our lives and our freedom, as though the invasion had been over for years. I'm Dave Moore. For a transcript of tonight's program, send $2 to The Moore Report, WCCO Television, 50 South 9th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55402.